So this morning, I want us to start continuing on this path that I've been taking of talking about foundational things to this church, to Hickory Corners Bible Church, that are beyond that, I would say bare minimum, but I don't think that's really the right word to say what we covered in the basics class, right? We're, so we're talking now about critical things that stand as guideposts things that are so important to this local church body, <clears throat> we felt compelled to call them out both in our existing constitution and also purposefully to consciously continue to include the, them in the proposed changes to our bylaws. The we, things that we as the leadership of this body have put forward to our membership to affirm. There are many things that this church does and often does very well, which we can lose sight of if we don't remind ourselves on an occasional basis. Set it before our eyes. Set it before our hearts regularly. <clears throat> so today I want to build upon that idea that I taught about last time. And if you recall, I had put this before you last time this way. Every ministry activity, and this is a quote from the bylaws, right? Every ministry, activity, action, and thought of the believer collectively and individually shall be purposefully designed and directed to bring glory to God, right? It kind of follows that same idea as the Westminster Shorter Catechism, that first question, right? What's the chief end of man? To glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. And so in our shortened Christian Life Hour time this morning, I would like to begin unpacking how it is we believe that God calls us as a church to bring glory to Himself. For we see in the Bible that God has given the church a mandate to be diligent in five areas, all designed to glorify God. First, in worship. Second, in edifying its people. The church needs to edify its people, build them up. Thirdly, in equipping its people. And then in evangelism. And then in guarding. Today, we'll only be looking at that first mandate to worship God. So let's pray before we begin. O oh Lord, our God, most high and most glorious. You are incomprehensible, yet you are prayer hearing. You are known, yet beyond knowledge. You are revealed to us, yet unrevealed in your totality. We adore you for making us capable of knowing yourself, for leading us to desire you. Let not pride swallow our hearts that you have accomplished this. For how often we have injured our Redeemer in such a way. We bless you for the discoveries, the invitations, the promises of your gospel. For in them is the pardon for rebels, liberty for captives, salvation for the lost. We pray today that you would grant us power by your Spirit to worship you now in spirit and in truth, that we may forget the world but seek to glorify your Holy Son and to set him on high, to render all glory and honor due to his blessed name. In his name we pray, amen. If you were go, to go into most churches across our nation this morning, right now even, and to ask them what worship is, I think you would be hard-pressed to find a good answer that is based in Scripture. The reason for this is that many, if not most Christians, and I'm going to use air quotes on that, Christians, are unable to discern between entertainment that has a religious veneer and true worship. 
Our culture has long idolized, experienced, and idolized emotion, so much so that this attitude has infected the hearts and minds even of true Christians, such that all too often their hearts have been cauterized and they can no longer recognize anything else. This is not God's desire. He desires those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. In fact, we will see this morning that those who truly worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. For the glorification of God alone, rather than the emotional ecstasy of experience, which has nothing to do with worshiping and glorifying God. Now, I'm going to back this up in Scripture. So turn in your Bibles to John 4. We're going to camp here for most of the morning. Most of, this, most of us here know this story well, probably very well. right? So let's just review some of the first part of it. Jesus has left the region of Judea, and he went back into Galilee. But rather than going out of his way, he's done something unusual for the Jews of his day. And is passing through the region of Samaria. You know, that place where the half-breeds lived. The impure descendants of Jews mixed in with other peoples. Remember, these people were considered unclean by the Jews. But Jesus led his disciples straight through Samaria, coming to the city of Sychar where he sat down by the well and waited while his disciples went into the city to buy them food. And while he was waiting there, a Samaritan woman came to the well. He asks her for a drink. She's shocked. You're talking to me. He says she should have asked him for a drink. And so she's confused. You don't have anything to draw from this well. He says, grab your husband, bring him back here to me. She says, I don't have a husband. He says, you're right, you've had five, and the man you now have is not your husband. She recognizes him as a prophet. And she's struck. He's a prophet that's talking to her. Not only is she a Samaritan, but even by Samaritan standards, she's probably not at the cream of society, right? Right? So in verse 20, she asks the most compelling question on her heart that she could ask a prophet of God. Where should we worship? When she says, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, and you people, meaning the Jews, say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Understand in this question that the fact that we should worship God is a given. The burning question, the foremost question that she has, is where? And Jesus' answer is profound, and we are well advised to pay close attention to what he says, starting in verse 21, when he says to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. The burning question, where? He's saying location doesn't matter. The places associated with worship to the Samaritans was Mount Gerizim, where they had built a temple on their own. After being rebuffed by the Jews who had returned to exile, remember the Jews uh, in Ezra and Nehemiah had told them on no uncertain terms, no, you're not going to help us. You are, your religion is defiled. You've mixed in other things. It's impure. And we will have no part of bringing something impure into our worship. And so they went and established their temple on Mount Gerizim. And now, years later, centuries later, that temple has been destroyed. The Samaritans, however, are still gathered there to worship. My understanding is that even today... You can find people who will trace back their lineage as Samaritans who will gather there on a regular basis to worship. But neither was the place associated with the worship of the Jews. 
the temple rebuilt under Ezra and Nehemiah, restored and expanded under Herod, that wasn't acceptable either. Neither place was going to be a place of what God considers worship. Next verse. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. We need to make certain we're rightly understanding what's being said here. First, Biblical worship of God is not based upon anything other than the fully revealed Word of God. To have an incomplete view, as did the Samaritans, who only had the five books of Moses, is not sufficient. Nor is adding in the rites and practices and alterations of the revealed Word of God acceptable either. The Samaritans, for example, in addition to the Ten Commandments in in their variant of the Septuagint added in a command to build an altar at Mount Gerizim to accept or to worship God. That's not acceptable according to God. True worship, to steal a phrase from the modern U.S. courtroom, must be based on the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And that truth deals particularly with salvation, beginning with the fact that it is necessary, and then realizing and believing that that salvation you need is exclusive to God's revelation of it within Scripture. You cannot decide for yourself what is acceptable. You cannot rely on the traditions of your culture. Notice that's what was going on here, right? The Samaritans said, we're going to go here. Why why are we going there? Well, because that's what we've always done. That's what we've always known. And that's not acceptable either. You cannot rely on the traditions of your culture. That's something that the American Christian, again, air quotes, Christian, the American church ought to take note of. But then Jesus comes to the heart of the matter as he continues in verses 23 and 24, where he says this, But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Do we worship on Mount Gerizim? No. Do we worship in Jerusalem? No. Where do we worship? In spirit, in truth. The question was always one of location. And what Christ is saying is that the place where we truly worship is in the spiritual realm. When our Lord declared in Matthew 15, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far far away from me, he followed that with a statement, with a condemnation, uh, uh, and a condemnation saying this, in vain do they worship me. It's saying the same thing as what he's saying here. It's no use to concentrate upon the physical action, even an emotion. If that action is not accompanied by, or more precisely, the result of an overflow of spiritual worship of God. And so we should be clear, by worship, we're talking about the Greek word proskuneo. We're talking about giving honor to a superior, to recognize the one to be worshipped as worthy of that worship to pay homage to them, to give them reverence and respect, to adore them, to praise them. The word literally means to bow down before the one you willfully submit to as being superior to yourself. So when we worship God, we ascribe worth and worthiness to Him and proclaim that worth and worthiness heartfully, willfully. And so when we consider that this worship is both in spirit and in truth, we ought to recognize and realize 
This is not talking about simply seeing and recognizing God as he is, not as we wish him to be, but also to respond accordingly. Isaiah understood viscerally what it means to worship, to recognize God for who and what he is, and to respond and acknowledge his his greatness accordingly. We ought to take careful note of how Isaiah worshiped God. For when Isaiah encountered the Lord on his throne, we read his account in Isaiah 6, 5. Then I said, woe is me, for I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, Yahweh of hosts. These are no mere words for show. His worship of the Lord God was an immediate and thorough recognition of the greatness of God over Isaiah himself. And he was all too aware of how not like God he was. You see, when we worship God, we elevate God over ourselves. In our hearts and in our minds, true worship is characterized by submission to God. He as the master, we as the slave. He as the authority, we as the servant. Not only is there a submission, there's also likewise a great reverence for God himself. To behold his glory is a fearful thing. For our souls viscerally feel their pitiful worth in comparison. Isaiah felt that he was undone on account of seeing the Lord. Moses' face was pressed into the cleft of the rock and covered, and yet still he was profoundly affected by the presence of Yahweh from that time onward. 1 Corinthians 1 helps us understand why we don't worship God the way everyone else worships their deaf, mute, dumb, and unliving gods. Where we read this, For consider your calling, brothers, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, and the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen the things that are not, so that he may abolish the things that are, so that no flesh may boast before God. Worship is not a boasting of ourselves or anything of man. Romans 1 also talks about improper worship. And the wrath God pours out now on those who give glory that by rights belongs to God and to God alone. We read this, starting in verse 21 of Romans 1, For even though they knew God, now remember, he's already established that God has revealed his his attributes, his eternal attributes. For even though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God. Or give thanks, but they became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the likeness of corruptible man, and of birds, and of four footed animals, and crawling creatures. So, what happened? What was the wrath? Therefore, God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. And again, for this reason, God gave them over to dishonorable passions. For their females exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way also, the males abandoned the natural function of the female and burned their desire toward one another. Males with males committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them over to an unfit mind to do those things which are not proper, having been filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God. 
violent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they know the righteous requirement of God that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. What's the penalty of worshiping anything other than God alone? Worthy of death. Not only is the worshiping the wrong God worthy of death, but also, so also is worshiping the right God in the wrong way. Leviticus chapter 10. Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took their respective fire pans and put fire into the, in them. Then they placed incense on it and offered strange fire before Yahweh, which he had not commanded them. Now remember, he had commanded them rather explicitly and warned them, don't do something else. And fire came out from the presence of Yahweh and consumed them. And they died before Yahweh. So we, when we go back to the statement in John 4, we ought to realize that there is a crucial seriousness here in the statement, but an hour is coming and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. If we are truly called of God, truly saved, then we ought to realize that this attitude of submission and reverence that results in the elevation of God as the one who is being worshipped rather than we the worshipers. Although we may be tempted to equate worshiping the Father in spirit and truth of John 4 with the spiritual service of worship in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, remember there it says, Therefore I exhort you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a, as a sacrifice, living, holy, and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. However, the tendency here is to say that worship is simply a life lived in service to God as a response to salvation. Now, it's important that we note this. There is a point that a life lived in service to God being an appropriate response to salvation, but that is not the same as being a true worshiper of the Father in spirit and truth. Spiritual service of worship, latreia, is entirely different from the proskuneo, worship which is a reverential rendering of the honor due to the Lord God Almighty. Both are important. Both are warranted and both are necessary. But we must never lose sight of the desire of God the Father in John 23, 4.23. But an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. It's specifically the Father who is to be worshipped. It is specifically the Father who deserves our intentional reverential awe and fear. There's a great danger here, too. There's an increasing tendency in many churches to take an overly familiar view of God, one which calls him solely by an affectionate pet name, which emphasizes only friendship, which views him only as the childlike daddy, which entirely rejects the true worship he seeks. I can't tell you how many times I cringe in fear, when I hear someone continually praying, Papa God, our Father who art in heaven, blessed be thy name. There's a reverence there. There's an awe there. 
It is this worship of the Father, true worship, that we must do first. The response of a, of a spiritual service of worship in daily life, of necessity, follows the reverential fear and awe due to the Father. For our God, remember, is a consuming fire. It is only worship done in knowledge and exaltation of God's revealed word, centered around the person of his Son, recognizing our utter dependence upon him that will fulfill this mandate that is given to us. And one of the primary purposes of Hickory Corner's Bible Church is to do just that in everything that we do. When we come together corporately, when we consider a ministry, when we have Christian Life Hour or our Sunday morning worship service, which remember, just because we declare it to be worship does not mean that worship occurs. When we gather together Sunday evenings for prayer, Word of Life and Awana, when we meet together for church business, when we gather together for special events, our purpose must always be through what we say, what we do, and in our hearts to worship God in the manner He desires, in spirit and in truth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank You for this day. I thank You, Father, that we have the opportunity now to worship You. And I pray that as we are reminded of our purpose in worshiping You, in recognizing that you are God, in holding you in reverence and awe, that we would be pleasing to you and worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You've been listening to a free message from Hickory Corners Bible Church. You're welcome to pass this recording along to others but please don't charge for it or alter it without written permission from Hickory Corners Bible Church. For more information about us, please visit us online at hickorycornersbible.org. There you can connect with us as well as join in supporting this ministry. You can also follow us on Facebook and YouTube to see the latest messages from our teaching and preaching ministries. Again, our website is hickorycornersbible.org.